academic year, which is organized by the NUJS chapter of International Law Stud Students Association. So the establishment of this ILSA chapter of NUJS has been the brainchild of, Dr. of Professor Dr. B.S. Chimney, who had been the pro former vice chancellor of NUJS as well as distinguished scholar of international law. So the NEJS ILSA chapter has held guest lectures in the past on various issues related to climate change and international law, the international humanitarian law, ecocide, state immunity, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in the current academic year, we have started the NUJS ILSA newsletter and also been instrumental in starting registering the university for this ICJ Judicial Fellowship Program. And today we are very much honored to have you with us, Mr. Mohit Kupchandani will be speaking on the topic, decoding the ICG Judicial Fellowship Program and LLM application to universities abroad. So now I would like to welcome Professor Atul Alexander, our faculty advisor for the NUGS INSA chapter to provide a brief introduction about our guest and start up the session. So what do you know? Thank you, Gargi, for that. Uh, so from uh, on behalf of NUGS, I would like to uh, profoundly thank uh, Mohit, uh, Kupchandani for accepting this invitation and being with us uh, to deliver a talk on a very important area, which I feel it would be productive for all the law students who are present here. That is on decoding the ICJ Judicial Fellowship Program and LLM application to universities abroad. I understand uh, Mohit is very busy in his work. And again, uh, I extend my thanks for accepting the invitation. So to uh, briefly introduce uh, Mohit. Mohit uh, uh, did his LLBALB uh, from uh, Amity Law School. Subsequently, he uh, finished or completed his LLM from Stanford Law uh, Law School. Then uh, he worked as judicial fellow in the International Court of Justice, working under uh, several luminaries in the field of international law. He, he also worked in um, the United Nations, and he is also proficient in. Uh, French. So as part of the Hilsa uh, NUJS lecture series, in the past we had invited scholars like Christian Tams, uh, who's from University of Glasgow, uh, Annie Sam, Annie Sam, Professor Annie Saab from the Graduate Institute, and host of uh, distinguished speakers in the sphere of international law, including uh, one of the ILC members, Anirudh Rajput. And in the same line, uh, we have a, have this privilege and pleasure to uh, host uh, Mr. Mohit Kupchandani uh, uh, to our uh, NUJS Hilsa lecture series. This is the uh, third uh, lecture series that we are organizing for the academic year 2021-22. And I hope and believe that uh, whatever Mohit uh, uh, I mean, uh, shares, Mohit shares in terms of his experience working in the ICJ and other organs of the United uh, Nation, uh, Nations would be useful for all of you. And uh, with this brief uh, introduction, I'll just, uh, just within uh, within 30 to 40 seconds, I'll just sum up what essentially would be discussed by Mohit. Essentially, uh, International Court of Justice, as you all, all would by, uh, by know, no, that it's a, it's a principal judicial organ under the United Nations with the primary uh, object uh, object of settling disputes between the states. And it can uh, render advisory opinions. It can uh, decide on cases which are essentially contentious. And of late, it has been very active uh, in terms of settling disputes between states. And you would have all seen uh, the role it had played in uh, rendering provisional measures in the case requested by Ukraine uh, against Russia. and. Uh, the entire thing about this university, uh, what we call a traineeship program or judicial fellowship, was conceptualized by the ICJ in the year 1999. Uh, this this uh, this entire thing is to facilitate the recent graduate students to gain a pro proficient in terms of practical knowledge about uh, the working patterns of international law in the International Court of Justice. And essentially, uh, a judicial fellow has to work uh, in, us, in in tandem with the judges of the ICJ in drafting and in uh, assisting the judges in uh, the judgments. And the entire duration is for 10 months. And uh, every year, 15 participants uh, are selected. But of late, recently, this year, what has happened is uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations has brought in this United Nations Trust Fund by which uh, 
this opportunity has been also opened up to the uh, candidates from the developing states. So uh, uh, as part of NUJS, uh, what we have done is we have, uh, um, uh, we, have uh, we have not essentially entered into an MOU, but we have made an application to the uh, ICJ and we have uh, selected a couple of candidates. Uh, we, we have narrowed, I mean, we have sent their application. It was routed through the Hilsa chapter at NUJS. And in that context, uh, to encourage more participants uh, to this, uh, I would say, uh, prestigious fellowship program, uh, it, it is only befitting that we have Mohit to shed light more, or shed more light into how the, the entire process works, and also also explain uh, the entire process of LLM application to foreign universities. So, uh, with this uh, brief introduction, I would like to hand it over to Mohit. Over to you, Mohit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mehol Gargi, Professor Atul. Uh, you've given a very, very kind introduction. Certainly, I'm not uh, deserving of uh, finding a mention amongst the illustrious names that you mentioned that have come and addressed the NUJS INSA chapter. I think it's a fantastic initiative, and it reminds me of my days back at law school when we had uh, we had inaugurated the ILSA chapter as a part of Amity Society for International Law. So I'm sure that there are a lot of enthusiastic participants here in, uh, in, in public international law, which is always good to see. And uh, so thank you very much for having me. And I think you also described uh, uh, some of the very specifics of the Judicial Fellowship very well, so that makes my job much easier. Uh, what I would actually like to do, because this is a topic that is so vast and I can continue talking about it for days, actually. What I would try and do first is that I will try and get a sense of what are some of the specific aspects that the students here are most interested in me covering so perhaps if you allow me i can invite five questions maybe right now which i will try to address in whatever i say and i would request you to uh, firstly address uh, some broad questions because at the end of this session for about 15 20 minutes i can again take specific questions but i just want to make sure uh, that i'm able to uh, to make your time worth it. So uh, if you have any five broad questions or lesser, and I'm happy to incorporate those in, in what I am going to say. So please feel free, anyone, uh, and I can take those questions or I can start by myself as well. But I just wanted to put this across the table if, if there are any specific things that people are most interested in. Yeah, anyone having any specific questions can direct it to Mohit or uh, alternatively, you could also post put it in the chat box. Uh, yeah. So if there are no questions right now, then I can, okay, there is one. Okay, thank you very much for this question. Uh, so this concerns career progression in international law and uh, what one must look forward to as a 10 plus year plan. Okay, thank you. This is something that I was going to discuss, so that's that's good. It's something that I was going to start with, actually. But OK, great. Uh, anything else? Uh, Sanika, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. My question was that what sort of prerequisites does one um, should one uh, look forward to while pursuing uh, an LLM in international law? So what would be some prerequisites that we can pursue on our own time instead of law school to really focus on international law as a master's study program? Thank you very much, Sanika. Okay, any others? Uh, 
Mehul has a question. Yes. Yeah, could you just throw some light as to how one must structure their CV or how one must uh, focus on like what activities should one uh, do in their in the course of their uh, of their time in law school so that they can maximize their selection, uh, maximize the chances of the selection in, for this fellowship program. Thank you, Mehul. Anyone else? And so, if, if I may, just if I may, just yes, another question. Yes. How did you choose to make that transition to international law from, say, um, like domestic litigation? And what was your experience like? I think you might be reading my mind. These are the things that I was going to do. Great. And any other question? I have four now. It could even be six. It doesn't have to strictly be five. OK, employment at international law firms. This is good because I was not going to discuss this today. So it's good that you have flagged it. Any other last question? Uh, what do you think the court is looking for specifically? OK. Thank you for these very useful questions. So um, I will begin now. Thank you for your questions, because they will help me uh, incorporating some of these things in what I will say. I, I want this to be a free flowing conversation, because unlike a lecture on a substantive topic, this is more so for us uh, brainstorming together about what are the opportunities that lie ahead for us, including for myself. So. Uh, I, I will be flexible in, in how I will uh, speak. I don't really have set pointers, uh, but I'm going to address all these questions in a free flowing manner, not necessarily one by one, uh, but in, in a transitionary form as, as I uh, try to speak. Okay, so what I will try to do is that I will begin by uh, how I started my journey, because that might address some of the questions. But this comes with a caveat that, of course, all our journeys are very unique to each other. And that is the beauty about public international law. Perhaps uh, uh, Professor Atul Alexander can, can, uh, can vouch for that, because, uh, for instance, he's, he's doing something that I am doing, but we are both doing it very differently, yet very passionately. So um, so I will just start by saying that in my case, to, to get to the ICJ was my primary aim since even before beginning law school. And perhaps that is the reason why I chose to go to law school. So I won't go into uh, the uh, the reasons behind that because they may not uh, be of much use and given the time constraint i don't want to get into that but i was very passionate about getting into the court i was interested in international affairs since uh, my school days there was a moot court society in even my high school so fast forwarding i just knew that i want to go to law school and I want to do an LLM in order to get to the ICJ. So let's just say that this was a reverse engineered process. I am not uh, saying that this should be everybody's process because, as I said, uh, everybody can have uh, different motivations, but this was mine. And so because it was a reverse engineered process, um, Everything was more or less a narrative that I had penned down for myself that this is what I want to do 10 years down the line because now it has been uh, 
it has been 12 years since I got into my law school. So in 2010 was when I got into law school. So if at some po at some point then someone asked me, what is your your I, I have received another question, which which I will take note of and address during the course of what I say. But we will have time at the end of this session as well for 15 minutes if there are any other remaining questions. So you can hold on to them for a while. So. Um, so I, I I decided that I will uh, go into law school now. See the law school that I got into. It's uh, it is a respectable enough law school. I was uh, at Guru Gobind Singh Indraprastha University, so Amity IP was where I studied. Uh, but I will be honest. Uh, despite it being uh, in let's say the top ten, twelve law schools at the time, in order to match up to uh, the fantastic level of education resources that national law schools have it, it took a lot more so knowing very well that i wanted to get to the icj and this may apply to some of you too uh, when you look at the competition from law schools outside now the top law schools from even the developed world I, because i i remember atul mentioned that uh, the court is now encouraging uh, participants from developing countries so a lot of those people also get selected now then the question that i asked myself was this how is it that i can after 10 years uh, or 12 years get to the icj somehow i i didn't place the exact 10 year deadline for it i was trying to get to the icj since a very long time and just took that much time but what i can also tell you and please don't feel discouraged by it but this is just an honest confession that i never tried to jump the gun or jump any of the processes uh in the sense that now you will be um nujs uh alumni and nujs can perhaps support your application even much after uh you have graduated because that's at least what stanford law school did for me they had applied for my application three times in a row so much after i had graduated from stanford uh, stanford still kept faith in my application what i want to say is that you will face a lot of stiff competition despite this paradigm shift in the general assembly resolution concerning uh the trust fund because at the end of the day even though the uh, home page of the ICJ application says recent graduates, but I can tell you that in my year uh, and in all the years that I know of, because I know now I know some of the people from my previous batches as well. Uh, in my year, there were out of the there were 16 people in my batch. Out of those 16, there were only two who had just finished an LLB. But they had also finished their LLBs from National University of Singapore and uh, and University of Montreal, as far as I remember. So what I want to say is that most people are people who definitely have an LLM, who also have some years of work experience, and there are also people who are pursuing their PhDs and uh, are also people who have finished their PhDs. So it now depends as to how much you want to derive from this ICJ Judicial Fellowship. Because if you are younger, then your mindset would be to take it as, as just another internship. But I would not uh, encourage you to think of it like that. Because if you really want to capitalize this Judicial Fellowship, and if you also want to capitalize your uh, LLMs, I uh, strongly recommend and of course the rest is up to you for you to have some work experience before uh, applying for the fellowship as well as for LLM application now I got a question that how did I uh, shifted from uh, domestic litigation to uh, 
to public international law. I have never considered it to be a shift. For me, it has been a part of the process. Coming back to my journey. So then when I got into law school, I I knew that in order to be a level at a level playing field with everybody else, I have to do something that gives me enough of a recognition regardless of which university I am coming from. And instantly I thought of participating in moot court competitions. So I took part in the Philip C. Jessup moot, Manfred Lacks, William C. Wiz, Vienna, Stetson. I did not have coaches. I did not even have the best of resources, but uh, and that might have impacted my performance in, in some of the moot courts, but that never deterred me from participating in these moot courts because if you truly believe in learning public international law, then this is something that can give you a great insight uh, into what uh, the practice at the court looks like. I think there is no better simulation than uh, participating in these moot courts. So this addresses the question of uh, what are the kind of things that we should do. Now there are some questions from students that I regularly get uh, which concern publications because at a moot court whether or not you obtain some merit is contingent whereas if you are writing a piece uh, which is well researched you might get rejected once but you have to work on it again and then eventually it can get published so it's it's a safer bet sometimes for people but I would say that when you are a student, I would strongly encourage you to take part in moot courts because that research never goes waste. You can churn out publications out of the moot courts that you've done. So whether or not you obtain merit at a moot court is in fact, I would say inconsequential because if you have researched well and if luck was not in your favor and you did not end up uh, getting a merit in that moot court, you can use that research to get a publication. So for me, I see it as a dual benefit. You got to participate in a moot court and you use the same research to write a publication. So this is a rule of thumb that I always followed in my law school. I knew that I had to work out of my skin first in order to be able to match up the competition from many national law schools in India and then to match up competition from outside of India. So I followed this process. I honestly participated in these moves. I did uh, get some merit despite not having coaches. Uh, but uh, even when I did not, I converted those researches into some of, uh, I think my some of my most well-researched publications to date uh, came at a time when I was a law student because now uh, everybody has limited time to delve deeper into many subjects. So this is one thing that I can say uh, one should look at. And, and then after graduation, for me, because I chose uh, Stanford Law School, Stanford has a stipulation that is you need to have a minimum of two years of work experience, even in order to be eligible to apply. So I had two and a half years of work experience. I worked at the office of the Attorney General for India at the time, Mr. Mukul Rodri, and also with his son, Mr. Nikhil Rodri. Working in that office uh, gave me the opportunity to not only be involved in some international cases that India was a part of at the time, but I would say more importantly, because I would say around 80% of my work concerned domestic litigation. And if some of you have uh, studied public international law by now, you would know that under Article 38.1c of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, general principles are emanated out of domestic systems. So India is a thriving common law country and having practiced common law is very different from having studied common law in, uh, in law school. So going through the process of litigation uh, at all levels of courts is something that really helps me even now when I was working as a judicial fellow at the court, 
when I was working at a law firm, these are the skills that international law firms also require. So this perhaps also addresses a question that came pertaining to employment opportunities at international law firms. See, if because this is such a beautiful field and, and you can choose many paths. So if, if you are very sure that you want to teach public international law, then perhaps I would not recommend you or strongly advise you to get into litigation initially. But if you feel that even momentarily you want to practice, then I, I would encourage you to, to, to practice domestic litigation in India for a while. And I also say this because, see, even when you get at an international law firm, it will not be until the age of 40 or 45. And that is also if you're lucky that you will be able to argue your first, let's say, investment arbitration case or interstate dispute uh, with a law firm because you will have to rise through the ranks. But I don't need to tell you this, that if you are practicing litigation in India, your arguing opportunities can come much earlier. And that is how I think I honed my uh, skills, not just of being able to carry the confidence to, to, uh, to explain to the partners in a law firm as to how uh, I envision a litigation strategy as, but also while drafting, because what happens is that if you've argued before courts at any level in any subject matter, then after that, going further, whenever you draft pleadings or whenever you um, analyze pleadings, as I used to do at the ICJ, you have that uh, backdrop. You have um, that, that instinctive uh, mindset that tells you that if I were arguing this particular argument, I would like to see aspects A, B, and C as well. So that's what I would say. It, it was very important for me. So it was definitely not a shift. I would say it was purposeful because as I said, for me, it was a reverse engineered process. And for me, this process existed uh, before the trust fund came into being. And, and when we were judicial fellows, we also pushed for... Um, equitable representation of people because uh, until two years ago, until when I was a judicial fellow, even people from developing countries were coming and uh, being a part of the judicial fellowship by virtue of having done LLMs at prestigious law schools. So that was the only way, essentially. I am so glad now that these opportunities exist for uh, people from developing uh, countries and and uh, institutions that have not been represented. But I think we all need to also ask ourselves this one question. Yes, the court is promoting uh, diversity, but should the court compromise on the quality of the candidates that it receives? Perhaps no. So I have full faith in, in, in the applications that you're making, and I'm sure that... Uh, that if, if any of you gets selected at the court, the court has definitely seen something and I will get to what the court sees. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that the average person who gets to the court ideally should be a person who has worked for a few years. Because see, for me to get to FIETA LLP from ICJ itself would have been absolutely impossible. It's not as if an international law firm just saw that this person has done an LLM and he's also done this 10, 11 month fellowship at the ICJ and that is why we should hire him. No, my India experience was very relevant. I had worked at the ILC with Dr. Anirudh Rajput who addressed you previously. I'm still going to uh, Geneva at the end of this month with him uh, at the ILC session. And I had worked at the UN in New York earlier as well. So for the three years that I was getting rejected by the ICJ, I was working on my French and I was uh, working at these different uh, UN opportunities that I got. And only then was I able to fetch the ICJ fellowship. And once again, this is not to say 
that you can't get it earlier but if you are really envisioning a career let's say outside of india or even in india as as a, a professor's role then uh, doing this fellowship at the opportune moment is the key because then people take it as as someone who has worked for a few years and is perhaps a mid level professional and is not just taking it as an internship but as a job and transitioning to other uh, another job while uh, while selling it in the same uh, way so that's what i can say and uh, now about the prerequisites of a cv i've briefly touched on it but uh, moot courts publications internships and internships uh, can be at un offices in india at the foreign ministry in india i think uh, professor atul and and mehul can speak of it because i saw on their linkedin that they've worked at unicef and unhcr this is something that in fact i have also not done i i uh, i did an internship at the permanent mission of india to the un so that was my entry into the un through the foreign ministry what i can also tell you is that sometimes people get disheartened that why are they not getting these positions but it is also about in international law uh, creating opportunities that don't exist on the face of it uh, approaching people without being hesitant um let's say if you're reading about an article that interests you then you do some further research on that and let's say you write a blog on that then you approach that person who has written that article maybe a professor and you write to that professor saying that i really enjoyed reading your article i have written a blog on something similar to your article and i'm sending it to you and i'd like to receive your input or i'd like to work with you as a research assistant now this is an opportunity that never existed in the first place but you have successfully created that opportunity because i get this question also that what are the opportunities that really exist for us as indians in public international law there are few but this is not to say that you are only confined to the few that you see as being publicized you can create them Uh, when i went to the permanent mission of india that opportunity did not exist for me i wanted to go and work there and once i worked there was how i finally got into the un so is is what i can tell you another thing that i hear is that what before or after the icj so the profiles that the icj sees is just simply of people who are passionate about public international law and who have worked in international law in any capacity now if you want your application to stand out then just add a layer further to it and this is my impression not something that i've heard from the court but i would say that while working in public international law in any capacity let's say as someone interning somewhere right now as a research assistant to a professor at at your level try to also engage with icj specific public international law so if there are any judgments that the court has delivered and you are writing a critique on the judgments or topics that uh, most often come before the court you can visit the court's website you can see the topics that are listed on the court's agenda there are around 15 to 17 cases on the court's website right now let's say many of them concern uh, the law of the sea so if you write uh, on the law of the sea or if you work with someone in the law of the sea then the court might be more likely to see you as a candidate that can uh, contribute to its uh, work more so uh, than other applications that it sees so this is one way you can write about the rules and procedure of the court rules and procedures that don't exist and you would like to uh, propound that they exist so that's a way to stand out uh, as 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 someone uh, in an icj application and 
as I said, you could be doing a PhD, you could be working as a research assistant, you could have worked like me at the UN. It does not matter where you have been working at in order to get to the ICJ. So that is another, I think, a beautiful aspect about how the court sees its candidates. Now, after the ICJ, as I said, if you are if you are lucky to get the ICJ fellowship early on in your career, then how the next 10 years look like you are very different. But if you get it later on in your career, see, I am at this point 30 years old. So I did the ICJ fellowship from years 28 to 29 in my life. So for me, how I looked at the ICJ fellowship would be very different to uh, someone who was 25 in my program. And let me also tell you that the youngest person in in my cohort would have been 25, not younger. So, so what I'm trying to say is that just keep up with with uh, whatever you're doing with with some of the things that I've just mentioned to you, and uh, also know that public international law will never guarantee you a linear career if you are prepared, if you've told yourself this multiple times, that I will never compare myself to any of my colleagues, let's say, who are working in domestic law in India, let's say in some law firms who are uh, going up the ranks, uh, because let's say people my age will soon be partners at law firms uh, in India. And if that does not deter you, if you don't look at those aspects and just Keep at public international law for the sake of learning. And this might sound as a cliche, but I truly believe in it for the sake of excellence. Then you will be doing something meaningful after 10 years. And I would also strongly encourage you to not just choose one particular path in public international law and tell yourself that this is the only one thing that I want to do. Uh, what I can share with you very candidly is that the way that my career has been progressing, it is purposeful. I want to experience public international law through different lenses and settings. So uh, if, if someone asks me, what is your motivation to work at the UN? I would say it's just one of the things that I would like to do in my life. I perhaps uh, maybe See, maybe there are other opportunities that arise for me in the times to come and one has to seek for some stability. But I've at least not approached my, my mindset has not been such that I only want to work at the UN or I only want to work at the ICJ. Uh, I, I have, as I said, worked at the ILC with the foreign ministry in litigation uh, at a law firm now. And I think all these settings are completing uh, the puzzle for me in, in public international law because there are different skill sets that I have been able to acquire from all these settings. And uh, this is how I would like to uh, continue, at least um, for the near future. So, And also, I would say that um, people who are interested in practice, because uh, I think people who are interested in uh, academics more uh, can can perhaps uh, uh, get the wisdom of, of, of Professor Atul Alexander. But I think people who are interested in practice should not be averse to investment arbitration and international commercial arbitration. Uh, I know that uh, international commercial arbitration can be very different from public international law, but at least investment arbitration is a subset of public international law. Even the ILC uh, discusses topics of investment arbitration many a time. Uh, topics such as uh, such as expropriation, such as most favored nation treatment, etc. So um, this will open you to the world of 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 international law. Now, lastly, I want to speak about language skills before I open the flow for question and answers. Whether or not you have done French at your high school level or even at your college level, 
let's just say that don't feel complacent about that because i know that the french that you might have done in your high school can maybe give you a heads up uh when you're taking actual french classes i take my classes from alliance forces uh and also i took french classes at bicj so uh, if you've done that in your high school that's good for you but that will only take you till the a level in french certainly not uh, after a1 if you have to get to a2 b1 b2 i'm currently uh, at b2 which is a bit more than intermediate uh you will really have to spend a lot of time um, at this moment to to uh, to try and work on these skills now being an anglophone nobody is ever going to ask you to draft anything in french even if you have completely learned the language the court just needs a certain level of proficiency uh, because it wants to maintain the two languages that are the official languages of the court and these are also things that can help you at other un settings other international organizations and at international law firms so i think this is what i can say at this moment and finally uh, yes one more aspect which uh, professor atul did touch upon see the role of a judicial fellow is is very very similar to what a law clerk at any domestic court would do you have to help the judge that you're assigned to um, analyze pleadings uh, prepare bench memorandums uh, in collaboration with the judges teams every judge prepares uh, her or his own bench memorandum and then all judges discuss their points of view uh, before uh, giving any judgment so essentially i think this is a fantastic exercise because um, you as one of the 15 judicial fellows will never be discussing any of the work that you do within your mini team that is your judge uh, an associate legal officer and a judicial fellow uh, apart from these three people no other judicial fellow will ever know what work you are doing this is in order to maintain the originality of a particular team you are supposed to write a mini judgment in your own team and then your judge will discuss it amongst the 14 or if there are more ad hoc judges 15 16 17 judges so um so you have to help your judge uh in essentially deliberating on a case uh you are also sometimes expected to contribute to a judge's academic writings if they are writing a piece a book chapter something like that and for also their speeches and the topics could be anything concerning public international law and also arbitration in my time I, I got to work on investment arbitration and commercial arbitration as well because my judge judge dalbir bandari with whom i work was once required to uh, address those issues so yes this is what i can say at this point i think we have 15 more minutes right now i mean we can extend by a few more minutes i am flexible that way and i think this might be a good point for me to take some more questions and if you feel that i have not sufficiently answered some of the questions till now i'll be more than happy to elaborate on them further thank you very much uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you mohit for that uh, there are a couple of questions uh, hands are being raised so i'll i'll come to ankit uh, ankit please uh, mohit thank you so much for for doing this uh, to hear your thoughts live makes it even more uh, vivid and, and descriptive. Now, I, 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 while you were speaking, I thought of it more as a checklist. So French, uh, I have to till, till uh, B2. So that's that's good, at least for me. And then writings and publications are also sufficient. And then of course, uh, we started a society in the university as well, uh, for which I shall call you very soon. Uh, but I was just very curious to know. So Jindal has no. I'm I'm sorry, Professor Alexander. I'm going to be very selfish here and just just try and ask what sort of a chance that someone who's been so through the trust fund Jindal's nominated me, and I have absolutely no idea as to what to expect 
and uh, this perhaps is more of a question for the registrar but i'm just going to pose it to you so do, are they going to divide it 15 so let's say six and seven so what happens to the international quota i mean it was like a quota whether you were admitted or not and i'm 24 i'm not even <laughs> 25 so where does where does someone like my application sit in terms of the other students will be there plus i've got admission for an llm so the llm is also hanging on my head plus this is also hanging on my head the registrar said that we'll get back to you this month but as of now nothing has come in so i'm just very curious to know also anxious also stressful but any sort of a tip that you could give in terms of what to expect from this will be very much appreciated thank you uh thank you very much ankit and and definitely i have seen you on linkedin a lot uh, being so robust about public international law and i can say this without any he hesitance that maybe i did not have the same uh, level of drive at at your age so fantastic on that uh see for french in fact when i was at the court i i was at b1 then i have b2 now so uh, if you have that much, I, I think you're covered there. Uh, about writing and publications, it's not something that you can you know, change overnight, your applications lying there, et cetera. It's fantastic also that you have been nominated. See, after the trust fund, the court might look at applicants differently. The, I, I cannot um, guess what the court is trying to see. Maybe the court will, reduce uh the age of the applicant and and so i i i don't want to say that your uh, chances are lesser or more but uh, see for me this is like i look at the fellowship differently because i want to even now i want to derive a, a longer term um I would say benefit from my judicial fellowship tag. So for me, it just depended upon whether I want it at, at an age which doesn't translate into other opportunities or at an age wherein, as I mentioned earlier, I can, I can sell it as, as an actual job that I did as a mid-level professional because see, the kind of work that you do, and especially as a judicial fellow or as an associate legal officer, uh, there are blurry lines sometimes. Uh, sometimes you may get such meaningful work that, you know, someone who is in their late 40s would also uh, be very grateful to receive that kind of work. And then there are other times because you're younger, you get to do some work which you may feel that, okay, anyone can can do this. So it's a it's a mixed bag and if you are a bit older then your team also recognizes that fact and this is something that can't be written in black and white if you are there if your judge knows that you work for a certain level of um, period of time then the work that you get can also be according to that so your judicial fellowships experience can depend upon how much you are able to demonstrate to your judge uh, as to what is your level of knowledge and understanding of law. And this is not to say uh, that uh, there's a certain age when you can have that understanding. By all means, I you might have that. But, you know, there are certain uh, perceptions uh, that are hard to erase. If if, if someone is, is, is 28, 29, 30, if someone is 24, 25, even if the 24, 25-year-old maybe knows more about a particular topic, the judges will have a different perspective and and might give work accordingly so if you want to transition into an llm after this then i think it's a fantastic opportunity for you but if you want this to catapult you into international law related work outside then maybe it could be at a later stage and now in any case your application is submitted so this is moot whatever we are talking about if you get it, of course, do it because, uh, you know, uh, in some years you may apply as an applicant uh, who's had more experience, but the court seeing something else in that particular year and there's some subjective element 
that that you know you don't get selected even when you are so whenever you get this opportunity just grab it uh but for pe- this whatever i said today was mostly for people who have yet not applied for those people i can say that they can wait it out for a bit even though the court has opened this up because also the jf application process is a bubble if you've applied once and if you apply for the second time the court is very cognizant and aware of your first application it's not as if so the mo- because they have a database the moment you apply your first application will be seen and then perhaps the court will see the improvement in your application i applied three times in a row as i said after my llm and it was only the third time that i got in uh so so in the meantime if i had not done something meaningful in international law then perhaps the court may not have taken me even for the third time so i would say that anybody's first application should also be an application that is uh not an application made in haste uh by the grandeur of this position because then the court you never want the court to have this impression that why has this person even applied at this point because uh you don't want the court to have that prejudice in your second application so make your first application at the perfect moment is what i can say this is not to you particularly ankit this is to everyone else uh so this is what i can say don't don't think about the results the court might be inclined to uh get uh, more universities and the court has been working co- quite closely with jindal law school so you never know uh, how it works uh, uh, for I, i just want to uh, sorry yes, but please, since this yeah. is the first time that this trust fund is actually being used uh, I, i would hope for all selfish reasons that they actually look at it in a more uh, in a more expansive understanding Uh, what would be very interesting to see is how they and this is what i said earlier so how they distribute the 16 seats or do they actually have then a larger number of fellows the other thing i just wanted to ask you is so is sorry this- before you get to that i want to also address this one thing now uh, throughout this uh, lecture we've spoken about the trust fund many times but we should also know this one thing for example a few months ago i would not name the person someone from Turkmenistan reached out to me uh and that person was doing a phd at a university there that is a university that is unable to uh sponsor a person for the judicial fellowship now if the court receives an application from a phd candidate at a university in Turkmenistan then the court will also consider that application uh as a competing application to yours who is someone um finishing a law degree so so what i want to say by the creation of the trust fund the court just simply wants to increase participation of people coming from developing countries whether or not it increases uh it decreases uh the Uh, the age or the level of experience required is something that only time can tell and i would not want to second guess any of that so yeah that's that's what i can say and i think you had another question and after this i i i will also encourage other people to ask questions yeah to shar please go uh i could please form a thumb sorry can you come again Sir, could you uh, please confirm the model? Yes, you are, but the voice is breaking just a bit. Um, all right. Uh, I'm really sorry if there's some. Maybe uh, if you try to switch off your video, then maybe your uh, voice might come up better. Is it better? Now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for uh, the talk, sir. So, but my question is slightly compared to uh, not initial fellowship, rather like one step before that we made them applications. So, uh, currently I'm serving as a judicial intern to uh, just give a chance, and uh, would subsequently for opportunities uh, for my LLM. 
Uh, and there's a lot of, after like a lot of survey, it has come, I've come to understanding where why we leads. They prefer uh, candidates with work experience uh, over uh, fresh graduates who are applying to, uh, for LMS, specific courses that are like, like international law. From anywhere from Columbia to Grad Institute, they, such you know, of uh, reference is seen. Uh, so my like my question is extremely simple. That what kind of bear would something like working with Dr. Rajput uh, or uh, something like judicial internship have on application? Like how far can they make a difference? And is it like really sensible to pursue an LLB in like international law right after the school? Or is there any course that would suggest uh, that also preferred way rather than just like as an alternative? Thank you very much for the question, Tushar, and many congratulations on working with uh, Judge Chandrachu. You must be having a fantastic experience there. So um, what I want to say is that, see, there are some law schools, as I, as I said during the lecture, that require you to have a minimum amount of work experience. You would not believe this. When I went into law school, I was 25 at the time almost 26 at the time and uh, some of my friends in my llm would refer to me as the baby of the batch even after having close to three years of work experience so uh, people in their mid 30s early 40s were the people who were along with me in my llm as well and there was so much to learn from people who had taken a break uh from work and had then come to llms and now imagine if after your llm because a lot of people see an llm as a key uh to the door to opportunities outside of india to work outside of india now if there are let's say law firms uh interviewing you and and someone who's in her or his mid 30s is is also applying for the same position as you are after having just been a recent graduate, then you yourself can answer the question as to who the uh, law firm might prefer for those job opportunities. So this is what I can say for timing your LLM well. I'm not also saying that wait for five, seven, ten years, but at least wait for a couple of years because there is a lot of learning that I think we all can satiate in India uh, before thinking of working anywhere else. Uh, so that is very, very important. Following the process and jumping the gun, I cannot emphasize that enough. It's, it's very important. Now, opportunities such as working with Dr. Rajpu, again, that opportunity for me came at a time when I had already worked for about uh, four plus years, I already had my LLM. I already had worked at the UN in New York. And then I worked with Dr. Rajpu. Now, some of the people who were working with me as his research assistant, even now, when I'm going to the ILC session later this month, uh, some of the other people are uh, still in university uh, in India before. Uh, um, doing their LLMs or working somewhere. So the kind of benefit uh, or the kind of objective that they have is different from the kind of objective that, that I have and what I want to derive from that position. I would like to meet people uh, who are ILC members to find working opportunities. So that is why I've chosen to work with Dr. Rajput at a later stage in my career. Now his recommendation might have helped me get into the icj this is my belief um because the ilc and the icj are um are very tightly knit because a lot of ilc members have gone on to uh, serve as icj judges so so that is uh, an automatic deferential value that the ilc gets so if you want to get into an llm then also you can work at the ilc but i don't think that you need that to get an LLM unless you want to work at the ILC two or three times in your life, which is also fine, because then you will get a different kind of benefit depending upon the stage of your career you are at. 
is is what I can say. So so yes, I I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, yes, thank you. Sahaj uh, has a question. Sahaj, yeah. please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Atul sir, and uh, thank you, Mohit sir, for the talk. I found it very insightful. So I actually wanted to talk about uh, international investment operation because that's something that you touched upon as well, and it's a field that I'm interested in working in. So I was wondering, uh, would you recommend a generalized LLM in public international law or a more specific LLM in arbitration like the MIDs or I think there's this one called TADS at Sion's post. So particularly in terms of a difference in perception, but also in terms of competencies that you develop and the skills that you would require to work in that field. So which of the two would you say would be better suited for a career in, let's say, investment arbitration particularly? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this question, Sage. And I would say that if you are very certain that you only want to work in investment arbitration and you only want to uh, work at international law firms, then maybe going to a MIDS is, is, is perhaps one of the most prudent options. In my case, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, I have not precluded myself from any setting in international law. That is why I did not want my LLM to be such that it places me in one category and not the other. Even at MIDS, you can you can bridge a gap because you can take some courses that allow you to have uh, a broader profile, is what I can say. But at the end of the day, uh, MIDS is specialized for arbitration. Now, my master's was in international environmental law. But uh, this was a conscious step because what it did for me was that not only did it uh, help me pitch myself as a specialist, but international environmental law, like perhaps many other fields, is one that has an interplay with a lot of other fields. Let's say if we are talking about humanitarian law, human rights law, even investment arbitration. Yeah, these I think days, you know, I think a lot of cases that are coming up have to do with environmental law and renewable energies. I think that is an expertise that's valued there as well. Right. So, so I was conscious about these interlinkages, and as long as you are picking a specialization which allows you to build those interlinkages, then your LLM is useful in more settings than one. And I think that is something that I would encourage everyone to do. So the um, the topic that you pick uh, is, is something that sh that could be transposable to uh, different settings. Uh, because, you know, unless you have this uh, very determined uh, approach toward just one topic and just one school and just one position, that is also fine because if you are so determined, then perhaps you will get to that place. Let's say if someone is uh, pursuing humanitarian law at Geneva Academy, that's one of the best schools for humanitarian law. But then I ask myself this question, uh, no matter how interesting humanitarian law as a, as a specialization field is, but if someone wants to work at a law firm, does that help? Perhaps no. I. I, I can't be more frank than that. So if 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 you want to work in a firm, then then you just make your decisions accordingly. And if if you're someone like me who would like to keep your opportunities open at international organizations, firms, maybe as PhD opportunities, so then try to pick a, pick a topic that is transposable. Is is what I can say. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I think that answers my question. Yeah. So, anyone else have any questions to ask? Please direct it to Mohit or you could put it in the chat box. Yeah. Yeah, Ankit, please. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but if there's an opportunity, I'll just pose it. 
uh, sort of a question based on what, based on observations of the speaker, uh, especially with respect to representing clients in in these very high stake arbitrations and also um, a limited scope of public international law cases. I mean, one, I'm really speaking about Mr. Salve and Mr. Subramaniam as as those being heavily involved in these. There finally there are some sort of a group of lawyers who are being involved in this, but they come at the absolute peak of their careers. So is this something that is this something that you see in other other jurisdictions or other lawyers as well? Because as far as I've seen, a lot of them are professors, uh, irrespective of irrespective of what field you're looking at. But since investment law was raised earlier on, one can refer to Professor uh, Vandenberg or or others as well. So I'm just very curious to see if, if this new trend of in, Indian international lawyers. Uh, working in these bad, bad, working in these chambers, especially in London, is this a trend or is this something which is uh, uh, just uh, which is going to die down gradually? Well, uh, I hope it does not. It's it's a welcome change, and it is good to see that people from our country are 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 representing it in, in, in such prestigious position. But I want to highlight one aspect now. Uh, this is not to take away anything from uh, the great Mr. Salve and, and Mr. Subramaniam, but when we look at general public international law cases before the ICJ, uh, they are not hired to, to represent other countries. Uh, they, uh, Mr. Salve might have been hired by India to defend India, but, but, it, uh, but if we are looking at uh, a more, uh, I would say, uh, a stable, even though stable uh, and, and international law don't go well together. But if we are trying to look to work in public international law and investment arbitration on a daily basis, then uh, this is not something that one can charter on as a path. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot advise to anyone to become a, a great name in in domestic litigation in India and wait for uh, sixty years of their life to then get their first uh, or second uh, investment arbitration case or commercial arbitration case and then become QCs directly. I I think that uh, it's it's not a path that one can choose for themselves. And I'm sure that Mr. Salve and Mr. Subramaniam they had not envisioned the heights. And, and the ways that they reach at these heights. So uh, if, if we are trying to charter a path and, and if that's our discussion right now, then then we have to look at, at you know, working in international organizations, law firms with professors doing PhDs. And I think you, you raised a very um, important aspect at the ICJ. Yes, we do see a lot of professors coming and arguing. Um, and uh, and we also see their research assistants. Sometimes people who are doing PhDs with them come in as as support staff in in ICJ judgment. So that is something that definitely people who are also doing academia can look at. It 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 doesn't close any doors. Uh, you can still be involved in with international courts and tribunal. Uh, more so with the ICJ and let's say the it laws. With investment tribunals, it could be harder for you uh, to uh, to be in in uh, in all these positions. But yes, this is also another part to be involved with both academia and ICJ practice. But I can't vouch for um, the careers uh, that you know we don't even know we will be able to make and 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 after having worked for 50, 60 years in our lives. Uh, those are two very rare examples. I would even add uh, the great Mr. Gaurav Banerjee to that list, actually. But uh, but I, I don't know how one can get to that. There are several, several factors that need to work in your favor in order to get there. And it's, it's not a path that we can charter for ourselves. I, I hope I was able to answer some of it at least. Indeed, thank you. Uh, and I 
Uh, there is a question that is posed in the chat box by yes. Parit Nisha. So yes. Would you like yes, to I'm, yes, yes, I am just reading that. Uh, so for the benefit of everyone, if the question is, I would like to have insights. Is there any option to work as a part of the ICJ when we are students or after our education to a member representing India? Um, I would invite uh, the person to actually clarify the question for me. Uh, are you asking that after the ICJ, we can work with an ICJ member while not being a judicial fellow? Is that your question? Uh, Farid, you are there, Nisha? Farid, yeah. There? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So my question is that whether uh, a student who is uh, over here, like for UNESCO, they are volunteers from India. They are representing and giving volunteers and getting a field work of whatever is going on. Whether it is possible for a student to do the same for ICJ, because if uh, we are uh, seeing, they want to be a judge in Supreme Court or High Court, not about ICJ. We don't have any idea regarding how the eligibility for uh, ICJ, the panel, uh, particularly Indian students are not there. I feel so. So if they want to be a judge over there in that panel, particular panel, and what should be uh, they should develop as like French, as sir was telling, and the other uh, like a public based platform, something like that. So myself, I'm from taxation department, particularly I'm doing it over here. And this is my final year. So how a student should equip themselves to be a judge over there. So is there any because we don't more than a representing, they should be a judges as well. So what about the possibilities and how a student should work for them? So some insight. Over. This is this is a question that I am trying to answer for myself too. I am trying to find the answer to this question. Uh because uh see now let's let's look at the careers of the four ICJ judges uh from India. If we look at Judge Dalvir Bandari's career, he worked in India as a judge till the Supreme Court level, and then he was nominated by the government. If we look at Judge Nagendra Singh, he was in the public service, and, uh, and then briefly, I think, worked uh, at the UN also, but while assisting the foreign ministry. Then he became a judge at the ICJ. If we look at Judge Pathak, he was a judge of the Supreme Court. And uh, so what I want to say is that there is one common link here, which is that you have to pledge allegiance to your government in some way or the other, whether you are directly working for the government or you are perhaps helping the government with some cases or in any other way. Uh, this is very important. And that is also why I think if people are interested in getting nominations from India for many positions, let's say even the ILC, then you need to have some roots in India. Don't be in such a rush to finish your LLBs and do LLMs outside and be completely disconnected to India. There is so much uh, potential in India as an upcoming country in international law I would also encourage many of you to work in India. It's not just working outside of India that will bring you uh, satisfaction. And then that can lead you to many such opportunities back because you, you, you've pledged some allegiance to your country. Now, let's say if there's someone who has absolutely no connection to India, has been doing great for herself or himself, uh, why would that person be considered by by the government so so that is one aspect that i can highlight now how you get there is a question that i cannot answer because now i i i told you about three judges uh two of them were judges in india all their life and then became icd judges one was a person from the public services sector so uh, and then let's say, speaking of uh, Dr. Neeru Chadda, who is uh, the Indian ITLOS judge, 
uh, she was working with the foreign ministry for the longest time with the legal and treaties division. So this is also another way if you're working with your foreign ministry for a long period of time, and if you uh, prove yourself, and of course, other factors that I need not mention here that work in your favor, then you can get to these positions. And as a result, India will also have uh, more of a representation of these bodies. Thank you, Mohit, for that. Uh, any any further questions? Uh, or we would conclude because I guess we are running short of time. Uh, yeah, I think there's just one uh, very uh, short question here from Surbi. Yes, I received the results uh, in April, end of April. I remember that day very vividly because I cried a lot <laughs> after receiving the results. <laughs> Uh, so end of April, I think your result can come anytime now, so keep your fingers crossed. Uh, Tushar has the question. I think, so unless someone else who hasn't asked the question wants to ask a question, uh, because I would like to uh, give more of an opportunity. So uh, otherwise I can let Tushar ask the question. And as uh, Professor uh, this, uh, this could be the final question, maybe. Then we'll yeah. Just, yeah. Tushar, please go ahead. Uh, uh, so can you please confirm the model? Yes. Uh, sir, uh, I'll keep like it's a very quick question. Given that sometimes it's uh, extremely the timeline of application process sometimes extremely important. Uh, for something like uh. The, the 73rd IELTS session that's going to start from 18th of April uh, and uh, the process of research assistantships because that's what would be the best, would, would be ideal for students at this point over in their final uh, year or uh, say penultimate year. Uh, when do you think is generally a right time for such application? Like when should we approach the um, IELTS members or um, any other? Um, Team professional uh, along these days. Uh, so, like, just can you shed a little clarity on uh, some when the needs and when you need to expedite application because of any particular reason? Is what's the way to approach such uh, people and uh, to actually uh, come off as a genuine applicant rather than uh, someone who's just trying to grab an opportunity and climb the ladder in the process? Thank you. This is a very important question because I think it underscores uh, coming across as a genuine applicant. So I would always, and this applies to each and every position that you apply for, don't believe in the quantity of applications that you make. Just believe in the quality and as specific as you can be, as tailored as you can be in even a cover letter that you write. Uh, this will catch the person's eyeballs because, you know, after all this time, even if I get a message, it takes not more than five seconds to see if if this is a question that has been sent across the board to many people or just to me specifically. Uh, and the same applies for applications. So firstly, do that. Uh, and you can do that by way of something that I mentioned during the lecture that was maybe reading upon that person, writing something. I mean, you don't necessarily have to do that, but I'm just, there are so many creative ways in, in trying to come across as genuine. You can maybe share another article with them saying that, oh, I read thing X that you wrote and I saw this thing Y online while digging deeper into the subject matter. And I thought I would share this with you and then I have this question, what are your thoughts? And I'm also looking at opportunity. And you are genuinely looking at opportunity, not just that you are reading something for the sake of it. So just believe in reading international law and it's, you know, excellence in it. Like I, for one, I, I also read international law for leisure. And, and, and the objective is not to reach out to someone, but I end up reaching out to people because I was reading about something. So, so if, if, you know, it has to begin with, I think, a genuine conscience uh, and, and you would be amazed to see how that genuine conscience 
uh, translates into the words that you write in in your email or or in any way that you reach out to that person so first feel uh, confident about and determine about getting a particular position or a particular category of positions as as you should not preclude yourself now about timelines uh, i can't give a uh, uh, a specific answer for ILC. See, you know that the sessions are from April to June and then July to August. Uh, ILC members tend to make you work on a longer term basis. Sometimes uh, research assistants even work for one year with a member because a member starts preparing for the ILC session at least two or three months in advance of the session. So I would definitely say that reach out to someone before the winter break so before december uh, reach out you know i reached out in in august is what i can say so my term was september to next august because that the next august is when the session ends uh, so it was a one year position every ilc member has a different process for selection i had gotten selected through vidhi india uh, they manage Professor Rajput selections. It's not just that you send an email and it's done with. That's a integral part, as I said. But then you have to write a research paper. There are interviews, and that's how people are selected. Because in India, there's a lot of competition to work with an ILC member. So what you can also do is that you can reach out to other ILC members. There are 34 of them. Find their email IDs and and write that email with the utmost sincerity and conscience and you can stand out in many ways that i just discussed and yeah just just apply well well in advance uh, even if you get a position for the next cycle that is fine there is no strict timeline for an ilc member is what i can say and for other places you will see timelines when they are prescribed if not they are on a rolling basis thank you thank you so much for addressing that really good to have a talk thank you So yeah, we have come to the end of today's session with Mohit uh, Chandani. So, uh, so from the bottom of my heart, I would like to again thank uh, Mohit for taking time out and addressing the audience on some of the most important issues or most important areas of international law, especially the internship part uh, with the International Court of Justice and the ILC and also shedding light into the application process for LLM. So, uh, and the, the, the talk only reflects uh, Mohit's passion towards public international law. And I hope and believe that uh, Mohit would uh, reach great heights and make our nation proud. And again, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mehul, uh, who ran from pillar to post in organizing this uh, event successfully without his uh, uh, inputs and without his interest we would not have organized this event and all the other members of the Hilsa team we are six in total and again I would like to emphasize the points which were put forth by Mohit the importance of doing uh, LLM and doing internships uh, with uh, in terms of domestic courts in India and working with uh, reaching out to people uh, and uh, knowing more about the subject learning for not for sake of learning but learning out of real passion towards the subject and as Mo Mohit has rightly pointed out the entire process is very competitive so once your application gets rejected don't lose hope keep applying keep learning keep developing your interest in the subject and I would also like to thank uh, all the participants who had turned up in large numbers. We had around 35 to 40 participants. I hope and believe that they would have benefited from today's uh, talk. And uh, I would also like to place on record that more than uh, being into practice, Mohit, I've seen and read some of his writings, especially for the United Nations yearbook, where he has written a beautiful piece on the Paris Agreement. So anyone who's interested could uh, could have a look, it's available online. So again, uh, on behalf of NUJS Hilsa, uh, we would like to thank uh, Mohit. Now I hand it over to Mehul for the official word of thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, 
Mohit, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and thank you so much for gracing us for this lecture. Uh, we This was one of the most insightful lectures that we've ever had uh, on, an, on, on, a, on a virtual platform and we hope that we get a chance to host you at a campus in Calcutta uh, if we get the opportunity to do so. And a big thank you to all the participants from across all law schools in India and, world, and the world who turned up and who participated in today's lecture and for asking such good questions. And this lecture would not have been successful without your participation and uh, without asking such, such brilliant questions. So once again, thank you so much for all, all the support and help that you've extended, Mohit. And thank you, Atul, sir, for being such a good guide and for supporting the research chapter in every way possible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I just also want to convey my most sincere thanks to everyone here, to Mehul particularly, who, as as Professor Atul rightly said, uh, has has a big role in in organizing this session. All the other members of your ILSA team and and Professor Atul, thank you for your words. I have also seen uh, some of the very interesting blogs that you keep writing and, and I, it's so nice to see, you know, um, someone uh, coming from India being so passionate about international law. And, and I would encourage all of you to also take, uh, take the advantage of having uh, someone like him uh, as your professor and, and, and learn from him uh, a lot. And, and once again, thank you very much. I think this lecture, however it panned out, was because of the questions uh, that were asked. And that is why I began, I have never done this before. I began by inviting some questions this time. And I think those really helped me channelize uh, whatever I said. So thank you and uh, continue uh, the passion for international law. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Mohit. Uh, we also uh, hope to in host you in the near future, maybe uh, physical mode, uh, and uh, share your inputs and knowledge uh, to the wide, to, to a much wider audience. Uh, I hope once COVID and everything gets out of the window, we could do that. Thank you, Mohit. It will be an honor. Thank you. Thank you.